everyone and welcome back to my channel today i'm going to be doing a special video it's going to be a question and answer video where i take your guys's questions on what it's like to be a biologist how to get into the career field of ecology environmental science and wildlife biology and then just some random questions that you guys have for me so i asked you guys on my instagram page at wild biologists what questions you have for a biologist basically and i haven't really looked through a lot of these so these are going to be a little bit of a surprise of what you guys are curious about. So I have a new idea um, for like a creator shout out, like wildlife creators that I'm really enjoying. Um, let me know if you guys want to see more of this in the comment section down below. But the creator that I'm shouting out today is Bird Names for Birds, which I discovered through Feminist Bird Club's Instagram page. And they are an organization, an Instagram page that advocates for changing the names of birds who are named after problematic figures. I thought this was so interesting. I'll show their page here. So go check their page out. I think this is a really cool initiative to help take back some of the names that we've given these birds who frankly do not deserve to be named after Confederates or um, other folks uh, that should not have their own bird name. If you have an idea for who should be in this creator shout out, um, let me know on my Instagram page or in the comment section down below. And I will shout out some more folks in future videos. So um, Broken Bunny 0308 asks, did you take physics in high school or university? So I took physics in high school one year and I also took physics in university. Oh, I want to say either one year or two years. Um, at least a few a few semesters of physics in college, and I actually really enjoyed those classes. So those were kind of fun for me. Lacey J B asks: Is there pressure to serve a particular agenda from internal or external sources? That's a great question, and that's a question that comes up a lot when people are asking about consulting or working for an oil and gas company or forestry com company. Um, there definitely can be pressures, uh, either real pressures, like actually straight up being told to you, or just kind of those internal pressures to please a boss, you know, to um, keep your job. There can definitely be pressures. And I talk a lot about this in my video about scientific integrity. Um, I think it's the number one most important thing a scientist can have is scientific integrity. And if you are in a job where your scientific integrity is not being protected and it's being threatened by a supervisor or a client and your needs aren't being listened to, that is a job you probably don't even want to have on your resume. Um, in some areas too, legally, you are actually obligated to work with scientific integrity. An example of that is a professional designation. If you have a designation of professional biologist, for example, Oftentimes, the issuing organization holds you to standards of scientific integrity and you can actually be charged and have your designation removed if you do not um, meet these thresholds of scientific integrity. So while there can be pressures, it's, and it's important to work with folks and explain why you're coming at issues the way that you are, but ultimately when it comes down to it, um, you have to maintain that sense of scientific integrity despite all of the pressures being put on you. Ecologist Elena, I think it's Elena, not Alana. I'm so sorry if I'm getting this wrong, but this is also Future Ecologist, so check out her channel. Um, she asks, how can I avoid a nine to five consultancy job after graduating while still being well paid? And then she also asks, are there any decently paying jobs directly in conservation with NGOs? That is a great question. So a lot of people don't wanna do consulting, which is totally fine. You will never be forced to take a job that you don't want. Um, that's the reality of it. You can take whatever job you want. If you refuse to work in consulting, then don't apply to any consulting jobs. Oftentimes that can make things a little bit difficult if consulting jobs are the only thing available in your area. So if you don't wanna work in consulting, um, you might have to move to another area if there's nothing else available. Um, government jobs is another option. You can definitely look at government scientist jobs. And another option is NGOs or nonprofits. So NGOs and nonprofits are kind of notorious for being the worst paid positions sometimes, which is very unfortunate because they are doing such great work in the world. Um, but that's kind of the reality. You can, I'm not gonna say like if you work at a nonprofit, you're gonna be like handsomely paid almost very few people in this field and generally are like rich, just, just from, you know, environmental science. Um, but however, you can definitely find something that's going to be able to at least support your 
lifestyle and your ability to live comfortably. Um, it might take some time though. It's those first few years that can be so difficult. Um, almost no one's really well paid in their first few years. And you know, that's unfortunate and I wish it was different, but especially with NGOs, you're going to find low salaries at the beginning, but if you stick with it and you live really simply, um, and just do the best you can to work a second job. I, and I know how this is coming off. And I think so much of this does need to change because there's so many people who can't do this and they can't make those decisions to work a second job because they have family responsibilities. And it's unfortunate that sometimes we have to do this stuff at the beginning, but you can, support yourself while working at a nonprofit that you're passionate about. If you supplement with some extra income on the side or, and, or if you can live as simply as possible. So that means avoiding student loans. If you can, I know the system isn't set up to do that, but, um, the more you can just like simplify your lifestyle, the absolutely better it's going to be for being able to have the flexibility to take a lower paid job in the future. Connell Bradwell, shout out to my friend Connell uh linking to some of our vlogs together uh asks which area in wildlife do you wish you knew more about and have you learned anything cool recently first thing that popped up to me was i wish i knew more about insects i wish i knew more about butterflies and bees and i feel like that's an easily neglected part of wildlife biology is like I often don't know that much about some of the smaller little creatures. I just picked up a new book from Simon & Schuster called The Language of Butterflies, and I'm really excited to read that one because I want to learn more about butterflies and how sometimes the smallest little animals can actually make a huge difference in the world. And a fun fact on that note that I learned about butterflies recently is monarch butterflies, which famously have an amazing migration um, across North America. They actually use the sun to navigate their migration. I think that's really cool. You know, we think about animal intelligence and we, you know, think about what we think as an intelligent animal, you know, like humans, people think are intelligent animals. I think being able to innately um, migrate and know where you're going is a pretty amazing form of animal intelligence. Great question. Nicole Kinney asks, is it important to work out and be fit for a wildlife job? Another great question. Um, so I will say weight isn't important for an envi environmental job. Like that's not relevant. It's fitness. So, um, I think the most important thing is being able to comfortably hike for long periods of time. And that can be difficult for some people. And it's really an adjustment for some folks, including myself, like to, have a job where you're like hiking so much and some field jobs don't require that much hiking, but like I would be ready to be able to spend like a long day out hiking. Often carrying heavy equipment on your back can be tough. Um, and then sometimes you're in extreme temperatures. So we don't only go out when it's like nice and warm and sunny or, you know, like these great temperatures. We're often out in like freezing cold temperatures or like boiling hot temperatures. So that can also be really t tough. So I think it's less of like fitness, but more like endurance. That's really important. Um, and having those basic abilities to carry like, um, backpacks with heavy equipment on your back, um, are really important when you are working in the field as a wildlife biologist. Um, and you do get used to it quickly. Um, as long as you have like some basic fitness, uh, you know, if you're out for days at a time, you're going to quickly build up that level of fitness and every day is going to be a little bit more comfortable than the last one. So don't fret too much if you're not at that position yet. Um, anything where you're like going through nature with heavy backpacks, that could be like the best way to build your fitness for a field job. Um, Babarade asks, what kind of training slash schooling do you have? Personally, I have a degree in ecology from the University of California in San Diego, and I've worked in this field for, I, can't, I would probably say a different number of years every single time, but I don't know, like six years now, something like that. I started working around 2012. Uh, yeah, so I don't have a master's degree personally, but I know many who do. So Lori D9 asks, is a bachelor's in biology a waste of time? Is it possible to work in conservation with a bachelor's? Well, you kind of need a bachelor's to be at least a bachelor's to be a biologist or a scientist. Um, you can get some technician work without a bachelor's, but it's very limited and it's quite common to see a bachelor's degree required. It's starting to become quite normal to see a master's degree required for a lot of biologist jobs as well too. So be prepared for that. But I would say, 
Um, a bachelor's degree is not a waste of time at all. Um, the major specifically being biology sometimes can be a bit tough to ironically to be a biologist um, with a bachelor's degree in biology because it's such a broad field. And with your bachelor's degree in biology, you're also um, covering microbiology. And there's a huge component of microbiology within that major, which can be tough because that's not always as applicable as like ecology or wildlife or environmental science or some of the majors that are a little bit more specific. So that's just something to think about. Evan Arvisu asks, what is field work like in terms of behind the scenes, hygiene, self-care, etc." So this can vary so much depending on where you were. I know personally when I was working at Amazon, um, my hygiene and self-care was much different than when I was working in Northern Alberta and I was going to like a camp at the end of the day where I had showers that were warm and comfortable beds, um, which I didn't have in the Amazon. So this depends where you're working. Um, it can be really difficult to balance work and life when you're in the field. And this is something that a lot of people don't think about because you know, when we get into this field, we, a lot of us want to travel, see the world, um, you know, dedicate their lives to conservation. And it starts to kind of kick in once you're like, well, some people for early, earlier than this, but for me, it was like five years into the field. I was like, you know what? I don't want my whole life to be work. Um, so then I tried to find more of that work-life balance, which can be very hard to do in the field. Um, that's why I've shortened the amount of time that I'm in the field. So I used to have a job where I was in the field for like two months. Um, and that was tough uh, because sometimes you are just way too tired at the end of the day to have any sort of time for self-care, reading, relaxing. Most of the time I was just like going back to my room and falling asleep. Um, so it can be really, really hard to balance that, but it is important, especially if you're going to have long field stints out, is to do the best you can to um, do self-care and hygiene that you can do anywhere, really. And um, I feel like if you're a backpacker, you start to get used to like, what I mean by that. Um, and I was always a backpacker, so it wasn't anything that was out of the ordinary for me, but like I would always bring my like Kobo, which is like my e-reader to the field. I would bring a hot water bottle for when I had cramps. Um, just these little things like the comforts of home that you don't necessarily anticipate bringing with you. And having that in there can make a huge difference for your self-care. Okay, um, Mohit Saini 21 asks, is there jobs available even at minimum wage after an associate's degree in environmental science? Yes, and I actually made a video recently about it that I'm gonna link to above, which are jobs available if you do not have a bachelor's degree that you can look into. Do you have to specialize in a certain animal slash location or can you go everywhere and do it all? That's a great question. I've gotten this one before. so. You definitely don't have to specialize in a certain animal. Some, very few people actually rarely do. Uh, many people work with multiple species throughout their lifetimes. I would say the exception to that being sometimes researchers can hone in on one animal. And I'd say it's most common around researchers or maybe government, um, state, provincial, federal specialist who specialize in like one specific animal only. Um, even that's quite rare. A lot of times they'll be like amphibian specialists. Um, so uh, that's the only time you'll kind of see that quite often. And then for location, the thing is, is most jobs, you need to be quite familiar about the species in your area. Um, or at least um, have an understanding of the local biology and ecology. So that's why it can be very hard for biologists to easily move between countries because why would they hire a, for example, American biologist to study habitats in Africa? If they've never been to Africa, they've never been educated on African wildlife, wouldn't it make more sense to hire an African biologist? So those are some of the things to think about is sometimes location, um, you kind of do not necessarily need to specialize, but like there's only so many animals you can be familiar with. And I don't know anyone who's familiar with every single species in the world. It's usually quite regional knowledge. Chevelli asks, how do you see COVID affecting your work field and the environment in the long term? Great question. I actually made a video about exactly how COVID affects the environment and how the pandemic and the shutdown is affecting the environment. I will link to that one above to check out that part of the answer. But how it affects my work field is right now, there is a no travel notice where I live. So I can't even go into the field if it's like, unless it's an emergency situation. So I'm kind of grounded. So that's a huge impact. Um, a lot of funding sources are being cut. Um, 
for new hiring. So it can be hard to find a job right now in wildlife biology and environmental science. However, there's still a lot of funding sources that continue, um, especially for jobs that deal with stuff that happens um, pandemic or not. So if you're studying industry and you're looking at pipelines or something like pipelines are still being built during a pandemic and uh, you still have to work and permits are still being applied for. So there is still a lot of stuff that's continuing, but a lot of like the optional projects have been paused for the moment, which really sucks. But I feel like when things open back up again, there's gonna be a rush of new jobs available. So we kind of just have to wait this out. Um, but in the long term, I see this field really um, even getting stronger because we aren't going to stop harming the environment anytime soon. I wish that was the case, but that's not a reality we live in. Um, and so we're always going to need people to quantify that loss and to mitigate against um, the loss of habitats and species. Emma Wickers asks, do you have any regrets in my life in general or with my career? You know, everything seems to have worked out eventually. Like uh, I didn't get into my master's program. I was very sad about it, but it worked out. I didn't get into the bachelor's programs I wanted, so I went to community college, but it worked out. I saved money. Um, so I feel like a lot of things have really ended up working out for me. The regrets that I have really are um, not respecting myself at the beginning of this job. I was way too easily swayed, um, especially working um, closely with industry. I feel like there was a lot of manipulative people that made me question my own intelligence. and. I regret not standing up against them, but I also didn't have that sort of confidence that I have now. So if I had any regrets, um, that's what it would be. Set your dire to the rain asks, hi, do you have any advice on finding getting into research as an undergrad? Great question. I think I've said that great question to every single one of those. Um, so the best way to get into research when you're an undergrad is to, well, one, look into if your um, university has a research center or a career center or anywhere where like student research assistantships, I'm not sure what they call them, um, are posted. So um, sometimes they can be paid, but most often they're volunteer positions where you will help out a professor at your school or a graduate student um, in a lab. Uh, to complete research. So there's a lot of stuff that's available for undergrads who wanna learn. Another way is reaching out specifically to professors. So if you have a class you're really interested in and a favorite prof professor that you get along really well, ask them if there's any opportunities in their research lab or any of their graduate students who need help with data. And that can actually be one of the best ways to get into research as an undergrad. If you have a school that has an option to do a thesis or um, like a senior project, I would recommend taking that as long as it doesn't cost you like any extra money or anything. And um, that really helped me personally kind of get that experience on my resume because you can put that on your resume and it really impresses employers and gives you the research experience that you need to apply for graduate school if you choose to do that later on. Serena Lovely asks, do you apply to grad school or reach out to a specific professor? Um, both most of the time. Um, so some schools, I think, don't require you to be accepted by a professor before you apply. For me, every graduate school I applied to, I did have to get accepted into a professor's lab before I could apply. There had to be actually room for me. And you'll see that commonly where a lot of professors are posting um, openings for graduate students. So look into what your school requires, um, the school that you want to apply to, and um, check out some of the lab websites for the professors because they usually say on the lab website um, if they have any openings for the following year. And if they don't say it, then um, you can contact them, but make sure you um, write them a really like compelling email because you're kind of selling yourself as a graduate student. So it's important to present that like professional put together image and give them all the information up front. Um, you know, I guess the disclaimer is some professors want things a different way that they might have on their website, but most of the time they want to see like your CV and why you're interested in joining their lab. Luex Seed? <laughs> Asks, asks, are your work hours normal, like five days a week, eight hours a day? When I'm in the office, most of the time, yes. But when I'm in the field, absolutely not. Um, my work hours are all over the place. When I'm in the field, I usually do a 12 hour day, sometimes more. So long hours in the field for sure. Um, unless you're doing some specific study that could only be done 
for from the hours of like 3 to 11 a.m., um, which is like uh, breeding bird surveys, for example, or if you're doing like a nocturnal amphibian survey that's going to be in the middle of the night. Um, so field schedule is all over the place, but um, office schedule is usually just like your nine to five type work. Eva Photos 23 asks, the science and academic world seems kind of cold hearted and intimidating right now. How do you think future generations are going to change this, especially since environmental careers are usually desired by very compassionate people? That's a great question. And I totally agree that the academic world is intimidating. <laughs> and scary and I don't I'm not saying like everyone in academia is cold-hearted but you have to admit that it can be very overwhelming for people who are not familiar with the world of academia to break into it I think it is changing um, I think as we see more diversity in professors and professors attitudes I think it slowly gets better because like that classic image of academia is like kind of like cutthroat like old old white male professors and that can be really scary if you uh don't look like that person that's like the traditional academic um but i think as professors are starting to become more and more understanding and diverse as time goes on which i think is happening um it's going to slowly become better and better and um why create this cold-hearted atmosphere we don't need it um we should be encouraging folks to be excited about learning and not scary and competitive and overwhelming but unfortunately that's kind of the nature how, of how i perceive a lot of uh, different labs to be. I had a great um, lab that I worked in during my time in uh, research. My professor I worked with was lovely. Um, so you can really find that special person, but um, it can be intimidating to have to sift through a lot of scary, intimidating professors to find the right one. Paige Hosler asks, what are some signs that I should be a wildlife biologist? I would say, um, People who should be a wildlife biologist are people who um, are passionate about animals, helping animals, are kind-hearted folks, um, people who love the outdoors, nature, and want to protect animals. I think the people who get into this field um, for money or for, because that was the only thing they decided to do, or for status, like if they, I don't know if anyone like gets into wildlife biology for status, but um, any of those kind of like other reasons, I... I would question if that's the right thing to do. One, because there's not that much money in this field. Um, realistically, like you're probably better off going into like petroleum engineering if all you want is money, I guess. Um, but also there's some trying times and some times where you really have to rely on your passion to get you through the hard parts. So I think that that's really essential to becoming a wildlife biologist. I think some optional signs are if you can have a flexible lifestyle, um, you know, openness to travel, move, uh, you know, freedom and you enjoy being on the road. I think those are great things that could um, mean that you, this job would be right for you, but they're not necessary, but they're just things to think about. Scott Spencer 4011 asks, are ringed piercings and gauges okay? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So the only time I've seen trouble with this, and I have a nose ring sometimes, I'm wearing a stud right now, with facial piercings is a lot of like industrial sites and construction sites do not allow you to have facial piercings, especially rings, because it could be a safety hazard um, when you're on a construction site. So sometimes that can come up. I'm not sure if there's a way to like tape things down. Um, if you have like a gauge, I don't know if you could like, you know, <laughs> tape your ear to your neck. I don't know if just maybe think about that, because sometimes it can be a safety thing. As far as getting a job, um, you know, there's, of course, still those people who judge uh, facial piercings. But I think it's not it's pretty common in wildlife biology to run into a lot of people with piercings and tattoos. I don't know why. It's just like that alternate lifestyle um, is found quite often in wildlife biology. So I've never found it was an issue, but um, a lot of people kind of play it down during the interview and then maybe will show their tattoos later on down the line. It's up to you. I don't think it's a deal breaker though. Amanda Perry asks, do you ever get bored when you're not in the field? How do you deal with a relationship? Yes, um, I get bored in the winters when I'm not in the field as much. Um, I try to just like really, I'm, I'm getting better at this, keep up with my hobbies. I think having hobbies that you can do on the go and also at home is really important. That's why I'm so obsessed with reading. I love to read. Um, and then the summer gardening, but I don't have that as, as an option in the winter as much. But yeah, finding some sort of hobbies you can do in the field and also at home can bring a lot of satisfaction for folks. And relationships can be hard, but um, 
I think like nowadays you can be so connected and there's so many other people who are in like long distance relationships that there's a lot of ways to still stay connected with a partner even though you're in the field a lot. Chloe Soybean asks, is it hard being vegan, being surrounded by a lot of people who work in the field and aren't? Um, it might have bothered me at the beginning stages of my vegan journey, but it doesn't really bother me too much anymore. Um, the only time I get really annoyed is when people feel like they can have an opinion on my own food intake. <laughs> Just, it doesn't, like, leave me, <laughs> leave me alone. Stop commenting on my food, please. Can we make that a thing that happens in 2021? Like, I don't... Please stop commenting unless I solicit some sort of comment, which I don't, so. Um, Lily McDaniel asks, how much do you study your local wildlife on your own time outside of work and school? So at the beginning, when I first got into this job, I was so tired when I was not in the field. I actually like struggled to really go out and do like wildlifey stuff on my own time. This channel has helped turn things around because I've actually been doing more wildlifey stuff to film like videos for this channel. Um, but it's hard, you know, cause it's like once you do something that you previously did for fun and you get paid for it, it's like, it's hard to inspire yourself to go out on your free time and do the same thing you're getting paid for. So I try to read a lot of books about wildlife in my spare time and just like enjoy nature on my own time, but not necessarily like as regimented as like, you know, bird watching and I'm recording all the birds or anything that like reminds me of work. I don't love doing on my own time, um, but I try to learn as best as I can um, my local wildlife uh, just in my own backyard. And I just take it from more of like a, uh, hippy dippy side like I go I like going out and just going and sitting in nature and not having like a structured wildlife survey to do thank you so much for submitting questions on my Instagram page shout out to my newest patron Zach Mills thank you so much for joining my patreon if you guys want to join my patreon to help support my channel get your own shout out the link is patreon.com slash wild biologist my patrons help keep this channel running so thank you so much for all of you guys who are supporting me through that platform I will see you guys next time. Bye.